Welcome to this um, uh, furniture webinar forum uh, brought to you by uh, Proudly South African and PG uh, Bison. My name is Happy Ngidi. I am the Chief Marketing Officer at Proudly South African and I will be um, taking care of the, of the flow of the program uh, this morning. Um, firstly, um, we appreciate um, those who are here at uh, 10 o'clock on the dot, and we apologize profusely that we are running eight minutes late. Um, <clears throat> what was happening behind the scenes was actually a little hilarious. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the technology threw a curveball this morning, so we're struggling trying to put things together. But we are here now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, so I brought about last year, this time, we actually had one of our, our first um, uh, uh, forum with, uh, with our partners today, which is PG Bison, uh, the DTIC, as well as SAFI. Uh, and uh, 12 months later, we're back here, but under very different circumstances. Um, obviously not a physical event uh, because of what is going on around us globally. And uh, so we've had to uh, go this route, but we are hoping that the session will be just as informative and as um, you know, and will have a, a, a big, great impact, and will really make a difference in um, you know, in 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 some of the um, areas with you know in which you work, and uh, you walk away from the forum um, with with um, with substantial information and 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 in great input. Um, so just a brief uh, background on, on the actual sector. Uh, the furniture sector is one we have worked with very closely as proudly South African uh, in the past few months, um, two years or so. Um, and it is one, of, one that has been vulnerable to cheap imported products, but it is a pocket of the economy with massive potential for job creation through the entire supply chain. Um, so in 2009, the furniture sector employed around 50,000 people. And uh, today, it supports around 26,000 with just over 2,000 establishments supporting these jobs. Uh, so these factories are mostly uh, located in Gauteng, the Western Cape, <clears throat> in KZN, excuse me. Uh, and the sector represents 1% 1, 1 of GDP and 1.1% of the overall manufacturing sector's employment. Uh, we export 3.9 billion of locally manufactured furniture, but the value of the furniture we import is 6.9 billion. The top growing export, by the way, is sprung uh, mattresses. It is the third largest labor intensive manufacturing activity with massive input of raw materials. So 75% of the furniture manufacturing is for domestic households. Um, so IPEP and the National Policy Framework has identified furniture as having job creation potential. And the sector is des designated for local procurement as follows. So school furniture is 100%, offices 85%, uh, bed, bed uh, and mattresses is 80%. Um, and that's just, you know, in an effort to give you a bit of a, a, a reality around uh, this sector in particular. And many of you in the audience, as well as our speakers, will, will know this information. Uh, but without wasting any more time, we've got a, a, a great lineup of speakers this morning, uh, and all of them intend to really make a, a formidable uh, input, uh, you know, in the discussion today. Um, and we uh, first um, in line is the CEO of Proudly South African, Mr. Eustace Mashimbie, who will give us a short overview of the buy local movement background and how it fits into this entire, uh, today's discussion rather, as it were. Uh, Eustace, welcome. Okay, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I hope you can see me now. Uh, These technology things are new to 
to all of us. Uh, but thank you for joining us on this wonderful morning. I am going to use this first part of my session to give you a sense of what the Proudly Essay campaign is about. And uh, to do that, I'm going to have a few slides. I don't know if you can see my screen. We can, you must just put it on. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. So we are a bi-local campaign and uh, our, our partnership with PG Bison stems from the fact that uh, the, I, a company that uh, has, its, has its roots uh, in the country, but also which makes its products locally and hence the partnership. And we're grateful for, for the platform. We're grateful that you have decided to partner with us on this day. Because what we are is an organization that is built on the back of the fact that the country battles unemployment, inequality, and poverty. And so we are meant to assist in that regard by ensuring that we get those who are responsible for buying either in the private sector, in the public sector, or at ordinary consumers to buy locally made products in order to make sure that we stimulate uh, the creation of jobs, but also that we retain those existing jobs. And this bi-local phenomenon is not new and unique to South Africa, but it's a global phenomenon. And if you look at countries like the United States, they have uh, enacted legislation to support this. And uh, the first uh, time that they enacted this was in 1933, where they introduced uh, the Bi-American Act. They followed that up with the Bi-America Act in 1982, and uh, in 2017, they issued uh, an improvement uh, to that act. So as far back as 1933, the US was already looking at ways in which they can continue to industrialize their economy so that those sectors that uh, are labor intensive and can absorb as many of their people as possible continue to get support. And so clearly, this is something that they've been uh, working on for years and, and it's tried and tested across the world. So in order to stimulate and revive their automotive industry as the United States, because that's one of those industries that used to employ a lot of their people, especially in towns or, or states like Detroit. They then uh, embarked on a campaign, and which is similar to what the South Africa can be responsible for. They embarked on a campaign to ensure that those who buy uh, vehicles uh, in their private capacity or for their businesses, etc. Then choose locally made vehicles at the time, and they rolled out this campaign. So I thought I must share this campaign with you to give you a sense of what is being done in other countries. And uh, in, in a few minutes, I'll then come back. In a minute, rather, I'll come back to give you a sense of what we are doing uh, as as part of South Africa, especially in the context of this economy of ours, which is not growing, which is shedding jobs, and where something needs to be done to restart and kickstart the economy. It's half time. are in their locker room discussing what they can do to win this game in the second half. It's halftime in America, too. People are out of work and they're hurting and they're all wondering what they're going to do to make a comeback. And we're all scared because this isn't a game. The people of Detroit know a little something about this. They almost lost everything. But we all pull together. Now Motor City is fighting again. I've seen a lot of tough eras, a lot of downturns in my life, times when we didn't understand each other. It seems that we've lost our heart at times. The fall of division, discord, and blame made it hard to see what lies ahead. But after those trials, we all rallied around what was right and acted as one. that's what we do. We find a way through tough times, and if we can't find a way, then we'll make one. All that matters now is what's ahead. How do we come from behind? How do we come together? And how do we win? Detroit's showing us it can be done. And what's true about them is true about This country can't be knocked out with one punch. We get right back up again, and when we do, the world's going to hear the roar of our engines. Yeah, it's halftime America, and 
our second half's about to begin. So, so that's the campaign. And, and if you look at that, uh, the images on that video, a lot of it is, is what we are fearful of. I mean, if you, you go to the clip where there are riots and people are protesting the fact that their economy is not uh, delivering for them, that is where we are, we, we, we are worried uh, because we, we have a sense that a lot of people in our country are, are, are restless. They're getting restless, they're getting impatient, they're getting nervous. And as a result, we need to make sure that we start doing those things that will help turn the, the tide on this economy as soon as possible. So th the U.S. Uh, has uh, pre-COVID-19 started uh, fights that are documented. I mean, trade wars, maybe that's a better way instead of fights, trade wars between them and China. And, and, and the trade wars are really about protecting each other's staff. So the, the Americans, especially under Trump, and I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, I spoke a few months ago at a, at a forum where someone said, I was saying this because I'm a fan of Trump. I'm not a fan of Trump, but I think the trade policies that he has put in place speak a lot to what needs to be done by other economies to protect their own uh, jobs, to, to ensure that their own economies grow. And what he did is he looked at industries that are able to produce what they consume as a country. And, and he then said, if they're able to produce it themselves, then it should not come in. And if it comes in, he levied much higher tariffs than where they in the past to try and block off uh, some of those products, but to but basically to protect those industries. And if you look at the, the numbers, look at the graph. Uh, I took the numbers from May 2017 to May 2019. The graph kept going down. So this is all pre-COVID-19. And so the unemployment rate stood at 3.6%. And this is a country with a population of 329 million people. If you look at the unemployment in China, which uh, I referred to as part of that trade war with the US, simply because China, it is a very good example of a country that is able to, to ensure that as many of its people are, are employed, especially in this labor intensive industries similar to manufacturing. As a result of uh, making any product and every product, whether they consume it or they don't, as long as there is a market in the world out there for that specific product, they will ensure that uh, they make that product. They will endeavor to ensure that they make that product and they sell it off to whoever consumes it. And that's why with a population of 1.4 billion rands, I mean, I took the, the unemployment numbers from July 2016 to January 2019, and you can see the graph kept going down. So, so they kept doing all the right things, and that's why they were able to absorb as many people as possible. But look at South Africa. With a population of an estimated 59 million rands, as per the latest number issued by the Statistician General, we're sitting with an unemployment, and this is before COVID-19. So this is the first quarter, January to March, the number stood at 30.1%. So even before we went into lockdown, we already had 7.1 million of our people unemployed. And that is based on the narrow definition of unemployment. But if you look at the broader definition of unemployment, you had another 2.9 million people who, who remain unemployed. And so you have about 10 million people, if you look at the expanded definition uh, of, of unemployment, uh, where you have about 10 million out of 59 million people who are eligible to work who are out of work. And so in, in real terms, there's about 89.7% uh, of, of people who are eligible to work are, are not in, in employment and 31% of those are women and 59% of the youth remain unemployed. So, so clearly our situation is dire. I mean, compare these numbers with what you saw for the US. The US has 329 million people living in that country, but with a 3.6% unemployment before COVID-19. But we, with just 59 million, we had 30.1%. So there's clearly something that we're not doing right. These are just some of the numbers that AP spoke about. But the reason why I have this slide, and, and I think Safi and the DTI will give you the most updated numbers, is that, that the picture that you see on the screen shows you that we are losing factories that make products. We are losing, number, we are losing jobs in the industry. But there's also jobs, uh, indirect jobs, that are also lost in the plastics industry, the agriculture industry, the textiles, and the leather. In the metals industry, so so I mean I mean here we especially especially concerned with what happens with sawmills and board mills, lumbers and particle boards. That all of these industries and including yourselves who are on the call are part of this value chain. So every time there are jobs lost as a result of furniture being brought in or furniture being bought that comes outside of the country, that comes from outside of the country, it results in jobs being lost across the whole value chain. And I think that's the, the point I'm trying to drive home. But 
uh, Safi and the DTI will, uh, DTIC will probably give you some of those uh, latest updated numbers. Here's another industry that is not necessarily related to this one, but I thought it gives you a good sense of what the status quo is as a result of our buy buying patterns. This is the clothing, textile, footwear, and leather industry that used to employ, uh, that used to have 1,600 factories uh, producing this clothing and, and footwear and leather products. In 1996, 20 years later, in, uh, in 2016, you only had 900 of those factories. So a lot of those factories closed down. And, and, and what you see on the right-hand side of the screen is, is, the, is, is the reason for, for this decline in the number of factories employing a lot of our people. 480% increase in imports uh, of clothing, textile, food, and leather. But look at the imports from China. They grew by 730%. And, and, and so that resulted in, in a loss of about 110,000 jobs just within that period direct jobs and remember there's indirect jobs that are lost across the whole value chain and that's why as a buy local campaign we look at labor intensive industries and we try and galvanize uh, support we're an advocacy group so we look at the buying that happens in the public sector and, and we try and influence that uh, and, and happy spoke about the fact that furniture is designated by the public sector that every time they buy furniture based on the thresholds that she unpacked they are meant as the public sector, as government, as every single sphere of government, they are meant to buy these products from, from, locally, from, lo from local producers. We do the same thing in the private sector. We lobby for support for the industry in the private sector. And, and we have uh, undertaken a journey to, to solicit commitments, and I'll, and I'll give you a good sense of how we do it uh, shortly. We, we then went in, we go into the general public and we talk to consumers and educate them on the importance of buying local. And, and because if there isn't demand that is stimulated from consumers, if consumers don't demand the products that are locally made, uh, then it, it defeats the purpose for those who are retailers, et cetera, who want to take up these products and sell them in their stores. So we also are responsible for promoting accessibility of locally made products and services so that we make it easy for anyone who wants to access these products to find them. This is, a, this is an example of the value chain, but I've used the clothing and textile industry because I think it's something that we can all relate to. We all buy clothing on a day-to-day -day basis. We all buy shoes uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so part of South Africans' role can be summed up in this fashion for any industry. Uh, if you look at the clothing and textile industry, you have designers like David La, Le Matrosa, Indalo, and Inga Atelier, and those guys sit on our books as members. We support them as small-scale fashion designers, fashion houses, CMTs or, or, or manufacturers, and what they rely on to take their products to market are retailers. And so retailers like Edgar's, Jet, and Fushimi Group uh, also contribute to taking their products out into the market, outside of some of these guys selling themselves uh, directly to the market. But the role of policy South African is then to stimulate demand for locally made products and services, such that consumers look for products that have the country of origin label. Products that say made in South Africa, produced in South Africa, uh, a product of the Republic of South Africa, because that way you know that you're buying a product that is locally made. So in order to do this, uh, in order to drive demand for locally made products, in order to educate consumers on the economic impact of the purchasing decisions, we undertake a few things, including mall activations, we're going to malls and we educate people about what the economic impact of buying local is. We're going to universities and educate students uh, because it's a lifestyle, it's about what do they wear, what music do they listen to, what food do they buy when they go to their favorite retail shops. As they, as they, as they graduate and they start employment and they buy furniture, what should they buy? What will it do to the economy? How will they contribute to ensuring that they themselves get employed? So, so we then uh, have other ways in which we do this, we work with the unions, uh, and that's why you see labor mobilization. We, we, we do consumer advertising, uh, both above the line and below the line. We, we, we roll out competitions, we do festivals. We also run sporting events, because that's the, the best way to get to South Africans, where they're relaxed and they can hear the message and it can appeal to them. And so in, 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 in continuing with our message to educate as many South Africans as possible about the impact of buying local during this COVID-19 period of time, we have seen how the economy continues to, to shrink. And in fact, when the numbers come out for quarter two, I think all of us expect that they will be uh, worse than they were in the first quarter. Uh, we will continue to stay in recession. It is estimated that we'll hit about 6% uh, negative growth for the quarter, and that we'll have about 3 million people lose jobs. So how do we restart the economy? How do we kickstart the economy? What we have done as part of South Africa is we've embarked on a campaign and we call it game time. And we've used the analogy of a football match or a sporting game where if, 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 if you're a sporting fan, you know that in the first half, if at the end of the first half you have not done well, 
at halftime, when you go into the dressing room, the coach has to prep up the team, has to come up with new tactics and try and ensure that, uh, that you know, that there's, the, the, there, is, there is a strong comeback in the second half to ensure that the team recovers the deficit if they are 2-0 down or, or whatever the score is and they need to come back so that they can win. There needs to be a change of tactics and that's what we're calling for. We're saying the first half, has ended in, 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 term, in our view, what we went through during the lockdown was a period where we paused as an economy, we paused as a nation, we we're all in lockdown, not many businesses operated, not many pockets of the economy were operational. And so it gave us an opportunity as we reopened the economy to start rethinking our habits, rethinking our purchasing decisions, rethinking our loyalty, and ensuring that that which we buy, whether it's raw materials for your business, whether it's consumables for your business, anything that you buy is, is is, is done such that you support the growth of the South African economy. And this is the campaign. And, and, and I hope it resonates with each of you because we want you to heed the call. The call to action is quite clear. It's buy local to help us create jobs. The second half is about to begin. We need to change the scoreboard. It's time for all of us to pause and rethink the game plan in order to save the future. I call on all of us to begin changes because greatness isn't reserved only for some people. By buying local, we're choosing to create jobs and sustain the ones we have. Time and time again, South Africans have taken destiny into their own hands. Yeah. Creating products that the rest of the world wanted to buy. See, the world remembers about us what we sometimes forget. But it's time for change. <laughs> Let's all buy local. It's game time. Zanzi. Local is lekker. Everyday decisions shape our future. So we, we have embarked on that campaign simply because we can't do some of the, the, the face to face stuff, like the mall activations, the, the sports activations. Uh, during this time, we have had to rely on that which can be done on digital platforms, on TV, on radio, and that's why we embarked on this campaign. And we hope that it resonates with all of you. Uh, it is on SABC platforms, on both radio and TV. There's a radio version of that advert that is flighting on, 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 on a lot of the, the SABC radio stations. We are going to roll out uh, the advert on some of the African language stations as well over the next few days. And so it's on ETV as well and on all their platforms on multi-choice and a lot of their multi-choice channels. So we are trying to reach as many South Africans as possible with that message. And that's why we need you as well uh, to also start looking at how you then position yourself so that you benefit by association. The association with Pali South African can only benefit those that clearly demonstrate the fact that they're buying local and that they are members of this movement. So it's about the movement, it's about the buy local movement. So as we go out and we say South Africans, buy local to create jobs. We need as many of you as possible to, to, to be part of this movement so that you can benefit uh, from, from the messaging and from the efforts that we're putting out. So my presentation, my first, the first part of my presentation stops here and I'll hand back to Happy so that we can continue with our program. And I'll come back later to give you a sense of what uh, it takes for you to become a member and, and to become a, a part of this uh, buy local movement. Um, thank you, Eustace. Thank you so much for uh, that background. Uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that the, the, the audience that we have today is, is particularly those who are not uh, necessarily uh, members of the, of the campaign as yet, uh, you know, found, uh, you know, the, your presentation quite, um, um, uh, you know, important. And, uh, you know, where uh, and hopefully as we go along, because I know you're coming back uh, later just to take the audience through, uh, you know, the benefits of joining the movement, the bi-local movement, uh, you know, and, and how to go about that and all of that. So, so Dr. Ghani, in, in, the, in, the, in the campaign, uh, you know, through that uh, TVC you saw, uh you know says it's game time um you know and 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 it doesn't get um any simpler than that uh, if you use the, the the football analogy that uh, Eustace unpacked for you earlier on that um you know um so 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 it's half time you know the pandemic has 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 
uh, has forced us as, as a people, uh, as a country, as a sector, as an industry, um, to pause and, 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 and rethink our game plan, because surely something has to give. But also just considering the fact that, you know, COVID-19, you know, just um, was honestly a final, you know, um, nail on the coffin, uh, you know, in as far as the economy is concerned. Even prior to uh, COVID-19, we had been downgraded as a country. Uh, our economy was in trouble um, and it still is in trouble now. And in the next uh, quarter, we find out exactly how much trouble our economy is in. And, and it really is, um, uh, you know, dependent on all of us to, to, repo, to pause, rather, rethink our, 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 our purchasing habits, rethink our attitude, rethink our loyalty to local products and local services. Uh, with that said, that said um, it gives me great pleasure now to, uh, you know, to invite um, uh, a friend of the campaign, Justin, uh, who is um, uh, from PG Basin, who will talk to us about, briefly tell us uh, how, uh, you know, their company is leveraging on the relationship that they have with Proudly South African. What does it mean for them to be associated with the country's bi-local movement? Uh, Justin, hi, welcome. Happy, well, uh, thank you having us on here. Um, as I said uh, to you guys earlier on, it's not really about PG Bison. It was really about creating a platform uh, to expose a lot of our customers and the guys that are on the conference call today to the great work that is being done by the Proudly South African team, the great work that's been done by Safi, you're going to hear from Bernadette later on, the South African Furniture Initiative and that also, the great work that the DTR are doing. Tefatsu is also going to be on the conference call and presenting what the DTR are. I think often, as private businesses, we get caught up in the negativity. We get caught up in the bad press that goes around. And we kind of think that there's no one in the corner fighting for us. And, and I like that analogy about a soccer game. We kind of, at halftime, we're all regrouping as a team. And it is a time to regroup and come out strong. And we saw what the... South African Springbok rugby team did when they started acting as a team, uh, kind of working together, a diverse team, and, that, and really were successful at the end of the day in achieving their World Cup aspirations and World Cup dream in that. And I think that's where we are now. We need to regroup. We all need to hold hands. We need to stop uh, pointing fingers on that. And we really need to all stand together and support this bi local campaign in that. It really is an auspicious time for us. We're actually celebrating our one year anniversary with the Proudly South African Initiative. So, this is an initiative that we were part of, I think, 15 years ago. Uh, we then parted ways with Proudly South Africa. Then I met Eustace and his team, and really I was blown away with the energy and the leadership that uh, Eustace and, and uh, Happy and the team provide in that. And we got on board a year ago and we committed to this proudly South African initiative. And I can tell you now from PG Bison South, we are really proud to be part of it. Uh, it's not a, as I said, it's not just about paying membership. Uh, there's a full audit process that you go through. They're going to verify all the local content. And we're really proud as PG Bison to have been audited and to be have given a certificate that 95% of all our raw materials that we use is locally procured and locally sourced in that. So that's that's really a great achievement. So PG Bison, we are a proudly South African business. As I said, we're going to continue flying the proudly South African uh, flag with regards to all our products in that and all our marketing material in that. And we wanted to create this platform to urge our downstream customers and our direct customers to join this fight together and to join us as a team to embark on really uplifting this economy again. Because if we all uh, think twice about our own purchase decisions, when we go into retail shops or when we are procuring for our own business, ask the question about where the product comes from. Uh, how can we ensure that we help uh, support and secure local jobs in that and not su uh, support offshore jobs in that? So 
really it's something that we all need to commit to and it does take a couple of minutes when you think about uh, your purchase decisions and that ask the questions i was really blown away two weeks ago i went into mr price home and i know they're a retailer that has also joined the proudly south african initiative and you walk through the store and i urge you to go and walk through a mr price home in that and go and have a look at uh, how they've marked locally procured or locally produced products in their retail stores. It's amazing to see that and it actually makes you proud. And when you start seeing how much locally sourced product there actually is and that the retailer is giving uh, that product pride of place, it shows you what we can actually do if we all stand together. So guys, without any further ado, I'd like to thank the team. I'd like to thank the DTI, Proudly South African, Safi for all the hard work that they do out there. You have PG Bison support. And we really want to work at this together because if we all support each other and we stand together, we can really come out of this a lot stronger and we can actually grow jobs in this country and we can create employment for the youth that are desperate for a future. And it's our role to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Justin. I greatly appreciate it. You know, um, you, you've just uh, mentioned that you we'll be celebrating our year, uh, first year anniversary since you've joined uh, the, the the campaign, and I'm going to take the leap of faith and say that uh, I'm assuming we are renewing because you you don't have a choice. Hey, Justin, you're now family. In fact, our CFO who's sitting in the audience now, Naresh, has just told me that he has approved. Uh, the purchasing of uh, access cards for all our friends at PG Bison. So when we go back to the office, we will have, uh, you know, free access to our office because it feels like um, we, you're beyond just a member. You truly are a family. I mean, you played such a critical uh, part when we launched our campaign three weeks ago, a game time where, you know, you hosted the event for us. So, so you're such a great ambassador of the work that you do. We, we, we met with Janine yesterday and we committed. So you don't have to worry about PG Bison's not going anywhere. We're going to continue flying the proudly South African flag for many years, years ahead. And it's something we all need to do. And I think we need to do it officially. I know there's a lot of people that are saying to me that they are proudly South African because they put the flag on their products and everything else. Yeah. Let's do it properly. Let's, let's join this initiative. Let's support this really superb team in that. I was blown away with the ads that you guys have put together. Uh, we all should host those on our websites and that, use it on our social media platforms and everything else. And we must grow this initiative. And uh, when we walk into those stores, look for that proudly South African logo, buy the product, make the right choices. And PG Bison's behind you 100%. Oh, thank you so much. So you'll be pleased to know that the second phase of our campaign, once the economy is kind of like, uh, a stable again, so to speak, once once we get back on our feet again, is that uh, we, we, we are embarking, you know, as, as a continuation of the campaign that we've just started now, Game Time, uh, as we continue, you are amongst, you're the leader of the pack, where we have a group of some of our members like yourselves, and uh, Mr. Price, um, as you alluded to the fact that you saw them, uh, you know, are doing great things with us. Uh, so where where that you know the, and, 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 and that that campaign at the top of this particular part of the campaign it's titled uh, they are in meaning you know Bison is in uh, in the movement and we're asking all the other companies that are not members as yet and we're asking them are you coming you know as so we saying PG Bison is in and are you coming so you're the leader of the pack and it's great to be working with you. Thank you so much. And uh, moving along to our next part of the of the of the of the uh, session, Eustace, um, we have you back on the. I don't know whether to call it a platform or a stage or uh, um, guys, you know, doing this virtual thing is uh, is a trap. Uh, you know, I was I was tempted to say you're back on the platform on the on the stage, and I'm thinking, what stage am I going to be talking about? But you're going to briefly tell us about uh, proudly South African membership. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Happy. So, Justin spoke about the fact that uh, they are a member of Pali South Africa and they are working this journey with us and it's actually 12 months later since they rejoined the Pali South African campaign. So, 
This is basically to give everyone who's on the call a sense of what it takes to become a member of this campaign and what the benefits are and, and give you a sense of what it is that you need to put in place so that you can also affiliate with parties that can and help us uh, grow the economy together. So I think the starting point is to, is to give a sense as, as to how consumers can identify companies that are part of this party so that can campaign. And for us, it's uh, through using the logo. That tells the consumer that the product is locally made, that the product is, is, is one that supports the creation of jobs and that in, 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 in the supply chain processes of that business, whether it's for raw materials or consumables, like I said earlier on, that consideration is given to where the product comes from and that the choice uh, that is made is the one that benefits the South African economy. So that's the best way to, to identify where the product is locally made. This is just an example of how one of our members uses the logo across all their collateral. They were happy to share this with us after we approved uh, their usage of the logo on all their collateral. And I thought it gives you a good sense. They use it on their vehicles. They use it on their banners, uh, both pull-up and flag banners. They use it on their leaflets and flyers on their website and on everything else. Uh, that they put out there to identify themselves as an, as an organization and, and to solicit business and, and basically as, as, a, as a brand building exercise for themselves. So who can become a member of Policy that can and, and also then use the logo and identify themselves and, and, and be part of this movement and benefit by association, like I said. Any company that uh, ticks these four boxes, the first one being local content, and I think we've, we've mentioned this quite a few times already in this call, whether myself, uh, Justin mentioned it as well. HP also spoke about the fact that companies that are affiliated with us have to demonstrate high levels of local content. PG Bison is at 95% local content, like Justin said, and, and so they tick the box. In instances where the raw material you require for you to make your product locally are not available in the country, we, we do allow for you to bring in that from outside. Uh, we, we, we are not oblivious to the fact uh, or ignorant to the fact that some of the components of raw materials required when making your final products might not be available in the country. But what we're looking for are high levels of local content and, and transformation of those raw materials into the final product must happen within the borders of South Africa so that there are jobs created in manufacturing those products. The second thing is companies that are affiliated with us have to comply with, with the right quality standards, the prescribed standards in that industry. We don't want to say to consumers they must buy that which is locally made, but you find that it, it is not at the right level in terms of the quality or the standard that is expected and, and therefore does not satisfy the need for which it is bought. And so quality is quite critical for us. We look at what is prescribed in that industry and we, we look at companies that adhere to those, to those standards. We then look at uh, whether the companies that are affiliated with us uh, implement sound environmental practices? Do they reuse their material? Do they recycle where possible? Do they dispose of their waste responsibly and basically help us preserve the environment? Lastly, we look at whether companies comply with the labor legislation of the country and treat their workers fairly in the course of doing business. And those are the four key criteria. There is perception out there, and I keep saying this every time I speak, that the perception out there, because we've heard it many times, is that uh, membership of Pali South African is expensive. Maybe it was before, but as part of this team that was brought in to reposition Pali South African, one of the things that we asked our board to look at was the fee structure. And, and, and uh, the fee structure was uh, revised significantly where companies that affiliate with us pay at the most 100,000 rands, and that is when, that is if, and when their turnover is above 100 million rands. And, and everyone else pays, as you see on the screen, small businesses with turnover of less than 5 million rands, pay 500 rands per annum. Renewable every 12 months. We am happy to hear that in the conversation with Janine yesterday, PG by Sun Committed, coming back on board as a group, that the entire group will come back uh, as members of Policy that can will renew, and we are grateful for that opportunity to again work with you, to again have, as part of our movement, a company that is able to, to help spread the message, to help continue uh, growing the economy just through your practices. Because as a member of Policy that can, you, you then commit to ensuring that you maintain those high levels of local content. And that is what we are excited about. We, we also have a turnover between 5 million rents and 10 million rent companies paying over 1,000 rents. And that is the fee structure. So it's not as expensive as it is made out to be. And the benefits 
include the use of the logo, uh, as I showed you how a company like National Fire and Security, which is in services, uses it. And, and uh, outside of use of the logo, you, you then have access to market platforms that are, are made available to companies that are affiliated with us. This includes listing on our online store, which I'll talk about shortly, but a free listing. Every member of Palace African can go and sell their products on that platform. You can sell any kind of product on that platform, and those who are your customers are able to, to transact with you on that platform. It has is, it is business to business capability, so businesses can sell off each other. Uh, can, can sell to each other off that platform. Uh, we have first hand access to tender opportunities, which I'll speak about shortly, and, and, and you're then included in the database of products and services, which is then promoted uh, out there to the world as one where companies can access uh, products that are locally made. When it's normal and things are, are operating as we know them, I think we're in the new normal now, but when outside of this COVID-19 pandemic period, we do buy space for our members to participate in, 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 on different platforms, including trade fairs and expos and exhibitions where they can showcase their products. We do put out uh, communication, extensive communication around who our members are, how to access them, what the benefits are. And, and members can also sell to each other and, and give each other special pricing. And we issue a newsletter on a monthly basis where members can promote discounts and specials to each other. What we do in the, in the public sector, is that we take our membership base and we put it onto, uh, onto the sub central supplier database so that any one of our members that wants to do business with government is then able to do business with government because you know that even if you uh, uh, make your products locally and a product and a tender is issued for, for, for local manufacturers to bid, if you're not registered on the central supplier database, you cannot do business with government. So as part of self this is what we do. We rely on the integration that we're establishing uh, between our database and the, and, and the National Treasury Supply Database to ensure that our members benefit. And how we do it is that we look at government, which has designated items. So furniture is one of those designated items. And government will, from time to time, advertise uh, procurement opportunities. So let's use a loose example. Let's say the city of Tuan issues a tender, and the tender is for furniture. So what we do is we then, through an online system that we've developed, which is an algorithm that looks at all the websites and focuses specifically on, on the pages where public sector entities advertise their tenders on their websites. We're able to find tenders. So if a tender for furniture is advertised by the public, in, public entity, let's say the city of Tuan, an example I used, we then are able to find that tender and then take that tender and identify manufacturers in our books that uh, would, would make those, if it's office equipment, we will send it to the office equipment guys to notify them that government has issued a tender. We will then, as a parallel process, notify the, the entity. So if the city of Swan has issued a tender, which does not comply with the provisions that exclude importers from participating in that tender, we will then help government correct the tender and include those provisions so that uh, the bids that are considered are only of those companies that will supply locally made products. So as a parallel process, we find the tender, we send it to the manufacturers to say, here's an opportunity for you to bid. But at the same time, we then approach government and we've been able to see some successes. In fact, a few years ago, just after we launched the system, we, we were able to intervene in a tender issued by the city of Jobek for furniture where they had not included those provisions and we were able to help them correct the tender and issue it uh, with the correct provisions. And, and that way we ensured that whoever uh, got the tender was a local uh, manufacturer or even if they're an, an intermediary that they will supply locally made furniture. So what this whole system does is that you then have a response from bidders that are local producers and government then buys products that are locally made. And that is what we do in the public sector for our members. In the private sector, what we do is we rely on our database of, of vetted members who, who produce high quality products locally, high quality products that contain uh, high levels of local content. I mean, if your raw materials come from a company like PG Bison, which has 95% local content, you already know that your raw materials are locally made. And so we can confidently go into the market as part of so that can to seek localization commitments from the private sector. So these are local procurement commitments where we go into an industry body and we ask that their members support us. And we've done that with the banking association. We've gone to the banking association and we said, can the banks all make a commitment to buy locally made furniture? So we went there and we, we got commitments from specifically two major banks who have now committed to buy locally made furniture. And in fact, outside of giving the commitment to us as part of the 
uh, I know that one of the banks has then written to the minister to inform him that they've made this commitment to Carly SA, say they'll buy locally made furniture. So Minister Patel has received that communication from this bank that said they are going to, as part of import replacement, uh, start buying only locally made furniture going forward. And that's what we did when we hosted our forum a year ago. We solicited the commitments and we, we, we secured that from some of the banks and, and from some of the retailers as well to say, can they increase the, the, their levels of local content in their stores? Can they buy more local furniture? And, and I'm proud to say that a store like Louis has now joined the Palace of Ken as a result of that engagement. And they've committed to increasing their levels of local content to as high as possible. We also got a commitment on that day from Fair Price. We started talking to Corey Kraft and JD Group. And so the conversations continue to ensure that we identify as many companies as possible on our database that can be referred to this entity. So when the bank says they want to buy local, they will want to know who are these companies or suppliers that they can buy from. And that is where the, the proudly say database becomes critical. We then refer our members to the banks, to the retailers, and to everyone else who commits to increasing their levels of local content. So where we don't have members in our books, that's where the likes of Safi and DTIC are critical because they're then able to point us to those suppliers that we can go in, verify, and, uh, and ensure that we take those list of companies and send the list of companies to the banks, to the retailers, to the corporates that are committing to buy local. This then leads to transactions happening between the buyers and the sellers where they buy from each other. And uh, what we do as part of can is we then over time have implemented a, mod, a, a, a system that enables us to, to track and monitor and evaluate the, the service levels, performance levels, just so that we ensure that uh, we can then open up for more of our companies because that is the drive that is undertaken to ensure that we create jobs. Some of the examples uh, of financial localization commitments that we have managed to solicit in the, in the private sector, and, 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 and as I mentioned some of them, is that as part of the job summit commitments uh, that we, we started working on in 2018, uh, October, we got banks to buy local, to commit to buying local furniture. Another example of how we were able to solicit localization commitments is where we got retailers, and I mentioned two already, that are already talking to us, and one in fact, the sign of the dot headline, there are members of parties that can where they are committing to increase local content, uh, locally made furniture in their stores uh, over time. And, and obviously we set targets. Uh, so we will say in the first year, if your levels of local content at 40%, can you agree on a 20% increase? And, and so we go when we set targets, uh, targets that can be attained, but we then need companies that we can work with to refer to these uh, retailers. The third example of what we do includes uh, the space of raw materials and that's where uh, we are today is about raw materials. Where are your raw materials coming from? So we engage those who utilize raw materials to say, can you look at buying raw materials locally so that the entire value chain is localized and, and can contribute to the growth of the economy. So outside of the end users needing to buy local, at production level, at manufacturing level, we also want companies to buy local. The last example is where we lobby market access support for SMMEs and black owned businesses. And, 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 and this program is aimed at ensuring that we drive inclusivity. I think we have not packed the fact that the country also has a transformation agenda that it needs to embark on. And so we have a program that is, is, is tailor made to support black owned businesses. And the example I've given there is where we have engaged the Franchise Association of South Africa to say, can they bring into their, their supply chain databases companies that are affiliated to Proudly South African, because these companies have been checked and vetted uh, for quality and local content. Because sometimes big businesses sometimes say they can't necessarily trust that the, the, those businesses, uh, the small businesses that are new to them can deliver up to the standard that they expect. And so we give that assurance that because we vet our companies, they can trust them. And so if you look at uh, at, at franchise level, the businesses that are opened up, uh, that open up, the businesses that renovate and, and they buy furniture and they buy other products. And what we're calling for is that when they make those purchase decisions, that they look at buying from our members. And so our online store is another one that is critical. Earlier on when I spoke, I spoke, I spoke about the fact that we have to increase accessibility for locally made products. We have to make sure that those who want to hit our call and, and support the drive to buy local know where to find these products. And so we introduced uh, a, an online store Whereas members of Pali South African, you can list your, your products on this platform and uh, you can list it for free. 
And, and this, is a, this is a platform that is promoted as one that sells high quality locally made products and this business to business capability so businesses can buy from each other. And, and some of the benefits of being a member includes uh, participating in this agile yet flexible organization because during this COVID-19 time, and this is just an example of the kind of things that we're able to do for our members, we, we, we looked at what was being bought and what, and, and what demand existed during this time. And so we introduced COVID-19 portals. And the portals focused on what you see on the screen, on face masks, on hand sanitizers, on detergents and disinfectants. Because as businesses uh, reopen after having closed during that first lockdown uh, period, they all needed to buy masks, as an example, for, for their employees. I mean, even the president spoke about the fact that uh, it's now a criminal offense for, for anyone to walk around in, or to be in public spaces without wearing a mask. And so we know the demand is there for masks. But in order to drive that private sector demand towards locally made products, we've created these portals and we've marketed them and promoted them. Uh, such that anyone in the private sector who wants to buy masks for their employees as they reopen, as they continue with their operations, that they know where to find locally made masks. And because if you think about uh, fashion designers, uh, CMTs and large factories that sell clothes or that produce clothes and, and footwear and those kind of items, during lockdown, they could not sell their items. And even after they were allowed to sell those items, the economy is so, the, the economy is, is in such a dire state that not everyone is buying clothes, et cetera, especially mostly because people are working from home. So those industries are really under pressure. Uh, and in fact, two days ago, we heard of a factory that is about to lay off 900 people. And that's just one example. Another one, we were told a week ago, is going to lay off 15 people. And so these guys have now repurposed their factories. Instead of laying off those people, they are trying to sell masks. So they're using the same sewing machines, et cetera to make face masks, but they need, uh, they need customers. And so as part of can we drive customers to the portals? And that's what we do. We, we are meant to reach every single private sector entity and our team has been on this drive for the past few weeks where we write to industry bodies, associations, uh, CEOs and CFOs and chief procurement officers to, 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 not, to make them aware of the existence of this portal where they can buy the masks so that we support those jobs in those factories so that we safeguard the livelihoods. Uh, hand sanitizers is another example. De detergents and disinfectants are some of the things that are bought in large quantities during this time. We then promote this and these are just examples of e-cards that we use on digital platforms and on social media to educate, uh, to create an awareness rather uh, to those who are going to buy, to say you can buy face shields. I mean, we, we're rolling out our face shields portal uh, to, between today and tomorrow. And, and the idea is that anyone who's going to buy face shields, whether in, in retail spaces, in, in their factories, in schools, et cetera, know that you can go into the Proud ESA website and you can find face shields. And this is the campaign that we, uh, as part of South African, we are agile, we are flexible, we look at what the needs of that industry, how we can contribute, and those are some of the things that we introduce, and we'll do the same for the furniture industry in different aspects, not just around portals, etc., but in different ways. So maybe that's where I should stop for now, Happy, and um, allow, allow other speakers to come in, and then I will then close off about what our thoughts are in terms of what can be done to help uh, grow. Uh, this, the support that we've been giving to this industry and, and introduce some, some new things and some new ways of thinking as part of can in order to support this industry. Yes, thank you so much, Eustis. Uh, much appreciated. Um, um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move right along and uh, invite a friend of the campaign once again, uh, Tafatswa who is representing the sector desk at the DTC. DTIC, uh, who's on the line with us, uh, just to also give us, um, you know, some uh, insights into what uh, the sector desk or the DTIC um, has been uh, busy with lately in regards to what is going on in the industry, um, as it were. Uh, Dafatswa, are you there? Yes, happy. Okay, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, my apologies, I'm not going to share the video because it's coming out upside down, so I will just speak. Um, you will just have to forgive me for that. I think next time I will share. I will share the, uh, my video. So my name is Tafad Zwanyanzunda 
from the DTIC. I am in the industrial growth and competitiveness division and we are looking after forestry based industries of which uh, furniture manufacturing is one of the sectors that we look after so firstly i would like to thank uh, uh, proudly sa as well as um, pj bison for the support that we get from them and i would also like to thank the stakeholders and the companies that are represented on this platform for the support that we continue to get from the sector in whatever initiatives that we come up with we've always had your rallying support behind so i would like to thank you for that so uh, I will just briefly speak about the initiatives that, that, that we are doing. Our role as a sector desk is actually to deploy various um, policy instruments to promote growth and competitiveness. And we also involved in policy development and we work uh, very closely to the industry in order to achieve um, such. So in furniture sector, like Eustace has said before, we are battling. We have had quite a lot and a number of companies shutting down. And since lockdown, I think some companies haven't even opened yet. So we try to see how best can we assist so that we stay afloat. And this initiative of buying local is actually one of the initiatives that we are trying to assist the sector to stay afloat. So, okay. Jesus Christ, okay. so we have recently embarked since the, the best part of 2019, we've been working on the furniture master plan um and the main objective of the master plan is actually to protect the existing industry as well as to promote growth of the industry i will not talk much about this I, uh, because of where at, at the stage at which we are now in the process of developing the master plan but bernadette will give a bit of of detail and then we also have the market access program. And this is where we try to use tariff and non-tariff barriers in order for us to promote local companies to access market. So one thing that I'm gonna dwell on today is actually the state procurement and furniture has been designated. So we, I'm gonna take you through and in this short space of time, I just thought I wouldn't go in detail in all the initiatives that we are doing. And then this strategic partnership that we've had with retailers as well as with Proudly SA. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that um, Mr. Price Home has signed on. I think uh, Louis is also signed on. And we are also working on the development of compulsory standards for school furniture as well as uh, some office furniture. And this process has taken long, it's painful, but we hope that we're gonna get there soon. Uh, we've also had an initiative that we've worked on, on development of the furniture manufacturing hub. I've put it here purposely because I think we've been a bit slow but we'll try to push once we're done with the a master plan and when we are now um, implementing the master plan. We've also been working on the furniture design program where we run a furniture design competition and it's currently open for, submit, for entries. And we've also been participating on design of a furniture design qualification. So, back to the furniture designation what does this mean this means that furniture was designated in 2012 like what eustace has said that all government entities 
government departments, I think we have over 700 of, of them, when they are replacing their furniture or when they are buying new furniture, they are supposed to buy local. So we had an instruction note that guide us on, on, on the procurement of office furniture. And in the instruction note that was issued in 2012, we had a threshold for each category. So for office furniture, there was a, a, a threshold of 85%, school furniture, 100%, bed and mattress, it's on 90%. So we made a few amendments to, to the instruction note and in the new instruction note, they've actually, we've actually removed this category a, a threshold. So we look at each, like on school furniture, any, everything is on 100%. And this is guided by the Department of Basic Education. They do have a, a guidelines on how on, on the school furniture that they need, and also by the a, 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 the standards, the school standards, so the school furniture standard. And we 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 don't struggle on this one. We we don't get exemption exemption requests. Here and there, we do get for maybe the top of the labs, there is a special, I guess, uh, uh, um, the special, what you call, board that they require. But I think with the recent purchase for UNISA, when they were redoing their furniture, they actually requested PG Bison to make them that board. So they did buy local. And then on the bed and mattress, uh, we we are in the process now. We've engaged in the process of revising this because we have timber base at ninety percent, but I think we can go to hundred percent. The steel base is on hundred percent, and the mattress is on eighty percent. But I think we can improve that. Yeah, this was mostly because uh, the textile some that is required, especially in the hospitals, we were importing that that cover the mattress cover so we 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 have started work here and we have started working closely with the um bed and mattress we would oh, sorry gosh sorry this has run ahead of me yeah okay yeah Okay, so on the hospital bed, we are actually having a conversation with our colleagues that are working on, is it furniture or is it a, is it a, a, a medical equipment? And we're trying to see who best can work on, on the hospital bed, but uh, be that may, because of COVID, we have done a lot of work on the on the bed and mattress. And then on office furniture, this is where we are battling a lot. We, are, we have already also established a working group where we are looking at revising this. And the industry is saying that we can have 100% office furniture. Our challenge is that we don't have a guideline. So when office, um, when, when, when procurement officers are putting together a tender, they will just go on internet and then they will look for whatever boardroom furniture that they would like. And then when this tender goes out, uh, it means that then the, the industry will say, no, we don't do this. We don't have this locally. So they come for exemptions. So in many cases, we will ask them to redraft the tender of which it takes time. And then in many cases, we will have to direct them to say, okay, can you have an alternative? He always put an alternative material so that we source local. So we are battling here, but we've put some interventions that, that we are now currently working on. We would want to amend the instruction note so that we are all on 100 percent 
and where we components that we know that we don't have in the country we can then uh, exempt upfront and we are also in the process of wanting to develop the office furniture specification public office furniture specification since 2016 we've been trying to get a service provider who can do this work for us we've used different platforms and still we haven't so through this platform if there's maybe a company that feels that they can assist us in doing this we think we need to talk maybe and then we can uh, try to work with them in in developing the public office specification that will be used by the procuring officers to get to 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 draft their tenders so this will help us also we would want the industry to be the watchdog and help us where they see that they are companies that have tendered and they are actually importing the furniture instead of buying from local manufacturers and also local manufacturers should be also uh, participating on the tender and so that we we do create the jobs the much needed jobs uh okay so all right all right so the other program that we are doing is the furniture design competition uh we have opened for designs for 2020 competition and it's closing on the 30th of september we usually have a very glamorous uh, event where we award the we, we announce the winners but due to covid that could not happen actually we were just a week before we did this event and we went on shutdown so it could not happen and like i've said in the beginning we have the sector rallying behind us and supporting us on this competition um i think uh, this is just what we are trying to say is that let us change our behavior buying behavior and let us try to look more and put emphasis on buying local whether it's food it's furniture whatever that we are buying because we know that by buying local you are putting a meal in more than one household for a day or more so we are together in this thank you so how do i <clears throat> thank you so much Tafaswa. thank you Tafaswa. thank you uh, and i echo your sentiments we stand together in solidarity um you know and i think we're all saying the same thing uh we all have the same agenda uh you know changing our purchasing habits and really just doing the right thing doing right by our economy um next in line is another friend of the campaign benedette uh from safi and she will be briefly looking at um at the development of the furniture sector master plan um benedette are you there yes i'm here happy okay fantastic hi there welcome thank you very much um, thank you, Happy, for having um, uh, Proudly SA and PG Bison for having um, Safi on this platform. Uh, we appreciate um, um, yeah, and hope to be a part of this, um, continue being part of this wonderful initiative. Um, so I'm just going to start with my presentation, um, just for the sake of time. Um, so uh, SAFI, the Industry Association for the Furniture Industry, um, was established in 2016, and that was around about the same time when we became members of Proudly South African. So we've been part of the family for four years now. Um, and in um, 2018, late um, 2018, we had had discussions with um, Eustace and the team regarding doing some sort of partnership initiative um, in terms of driving the buy local campaign and also the partnership with the furniture industry. And that's when together with PG Bison, Proudly SA 
and the DTIC uh, last year, we um, launched our furniture sector forum, um, where we actually started that buy local campaign within the furniture industry. Um, so SAFI is a joint initiative of industry, labor and government. Um, and our main mandate is to promote um, and sustain also employment growth, uh, value addition and transformation across the value chain. Um, just a, sh a brief overview, I won't go through all the programs, but just in terms of our pillars and projects um, that SAFI, and we do this also as the Fadwa has mentioned, um, in partnership with the DTIC, um, and that is our market access programs. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, we've played a, a support role for the furniture industry in terms of the COVID-19 um, um, a recovery support program. Uh, we are also uh, launched a furniture directory for the furniture industry and as I mentioned the furniture sector forum that we did in partnership with the other stakeholders um, last year. And then as the funds was already touched on and I won't go into it, um, into it in detail but our trade remedy programs in terms of rebate applications and also our very recent uh, SARS furniture forum um, to address um, um, the um, imports um, in coming into the country. Um, our last uh, pillar and projects are our skills and qualification development projects, which the FADWA has already also touched on. Um, for the purpose of this uh, webinar today, um, we've been asked to give an overview and update on the furniture industry master plan. Um, so just um, um, to give a bit of background, um, Late 2018, uh, we had discussions with the DTIC in terms of the development of a furniture master plan. In August of 2019, uh, we appointed a service provider. Um, we also then formed a steering committee uh, for the furniture industry master plan and the first inception meeting was held um, in August 2019. Since August 2019, up until the end of last year, um, there was um, um, many stakeholder consultations as well as um, a situational analysis report that was then presented to the committee. Um, there were further um, consultations with um, the stakeholders and the minister and the DG with regards to the the um, draft situational analysis um, and the final situational analysis was presented in January of 2020. Um, at the start of this year, there were uh, five um, um, furniture stakeholder workshops um, uh, running um, the five provinces across the country, where we had further engagements with all stakeholders in the value chain um, regarding the draft implementation, um, sorry, master plan. Um, and that took place between January and February of this year. Um, from February up until now, July, uh, we are in the process of signing off the uh, master plan, implementation plan, as well as the monitoring and evaluation plan. Um, in terms of the way forward for the furniture industry master plan, um, during the months of August and September, we will have consultations and engagements, uh, what we call bilateral agreements, uh, sorry, engagements with the minister um, or the DG uh, with regards to finalizing the master plan um, and the commitments also from both the public and the private sector. And we are hoping that the um, furniture in industry master plan is implemented or signed off and implemented um, November 2020. Just to give you a bit of a, a, a snapshot or an overview of um, what's been covered in the furniture industry master plan, um, what's been identified is um, three pillars. Um, or overarching pillars is that is to improve market access um, in the furniture industry, um, to address transformation in the furniture industry, as well as improve competitiveness. Under the improvement of market access program, we'll look at uh, programs like um, improving protection against imports, and I've already mentioned that we have, um, um, with um, SARS, uh, established a uh, furniture forum that will deal with um, um, that program um, going forward. Um, also, the um, transformation program is to put together a transformation plan for the furniture industry um, and also to um, implement um, for our small, medium um, and micro enterprises um, to be part of that transformation plan. 
in terms of our pillar of improving competitiveness in the industry is to look at um, cost and productivity improvement programs, um, also to look at our skill development programs and what is needed um, in the furniture industry, um, you know, post COVID-19, and also um, to look at having annual um, data collated in the furniture industry um, and regular um, audits um, being, being conducted in the industry. And that is us. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Benedict. Thank you for, for your contribution. Um, we still have about uh, less than 10 minutes, and I was hoping that somebody um, in the audience would have, um, I would imagine, there's maybe one or two comments or a question um, you know, from, from the audience. If there is, uh, please may I request that you type it in and um, uh, if the team, uh, the PR team can just make me aware of any, any uh, questions that may be, uh, if, you know, a burning question that I might, I might need to uh, take care of. Thank you so much, Benedict. Much appreciated. Um, and we will now, um, uh, move on to the next uh, part of the session uh, where we have uh, Eustace back on, on, on online uh, just to give us a quick summary of uh, how being part of the bi-local movement can benefit the sector in, in, in specifically. Um, and the, that'll be shortly thereafter. We will, um, it will have come to the end of the session for the day. Thanks, Eustace. Okay, thank you, Happy. Uh, so this will take uh, three minutes tops so that we can then take questions from anyone that uh, has questions for any of us that spoke today. So sincere thanks to Tafalsa and Bernadette for their contributions uh, to this session. So in closing from Party South African, how can the Party SA buy local campaign benefit the furniture industry? So over and above what I mentioned earlier on, what is it that as a bi-local campaign we can continue to roll out together with all of you as role players in this industry? We are concerned with route to market. How does the product reach the end user? And that is how we position our role. And like, like I mentioned in a slide earlier on when I, where I showed you that the role of public South is to ensure that we stimulate demand and we ensure that those who buy choose locally made products. So we're intermediary retailers. Uh, uh, part of the value chain, where tenderpreneurs, for lack of a better word, tenderpreneurs, those who bid for tenders and opportunities, whether in the private sector or, or public sector, when they when they win uh, those bids, when they get those contracts and they are meant to take the products into the market, what do they buy? Uh, and, and where is it coming from? And, and that is our role as policy of can. We are concerned with ensuring that the intermediaries or retailers buy the furniture items from local sources and in our conversations, we're going to ensure that we touch base with that, those levels that you see below, uh, the intermediate retailers and the tenderpreneurs, ensure that they get the commitments that will force the retailers and the tenderpreneurs uh, to buy local. So if the banks and the insurance companies and everyone who runs a corporate office gives us a commitment to say they're going to buy locally made furniture, that will trickle up to the retailers and will force them to stock up on locally made furniture and to buy from you that makes your furniture locally. Same as the tender premiers, when those contracts come out, whether from the private sector or the public sector, either for hospitals, the hotels, the lodges, the BNBs, private schools and the public schools, the prisons and the hospitals, uh, as well as ordinary consumers, if any of them, if all of them demand locally made products uh, if, and, 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 and make it clear that they will not accept imported products when it comes to certain categories of furniture that they want to buy, or all categories of furniture if we, we succeed in our course, then it will force the tenderpreneurs to start looking for the products locally when they bid for the contracts. Because that is what the consumers, at the bottom is the consumers. Those are the people that we've identified as consumers who if they demand this, they will force the ones on top to buy the intermediaries, to buy the locally made furniture item that comes from you. And that is the role of Palace of Can. Those are, that gives you a, a quick synopsis of who we are talking to who we have been engaging over the, over the last two years since we started engaging with SAFI and, 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 and the TTIC, Furniture Sector Desk, to try and see how we can support this industry. 
We have developed the Spanish portal. I spoke about the COVID-19 portals that we had developed uh, during this time to support those industries. For furniture, we have developed this portal. This is how the portal looks. This is the first time all of you see it. We are ready to go live with the portal. If you go into the COVID-19, the, the portion in red, uh, the portion, this portion in red is where you, you are able to click on the Proudly SA website and, 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 and go to the COVID-19 portals. And next to it is the furniture portal. So you are going to launch a furniture portal. Once we go live, you click there, you are going to get, a, you are going to get options of office equipment, uh, beds and mattresses, lounge, kitchen and other, and in there we're going to list local manufacturers that are making their furniture locally. So anyone who affiliates with Pali South African wants to sell their products on there because the idea is that all these people here, when they want to know who to buy from, we need to have a base of companies sitting in this portal that they can immediately go on the portal, find the contact numbers uh, with, with address. And, and, and if, as, as an example, a bank in the free state wants to buy from a branch based in the free state, they can then find a supply in the free state and support a business in their, in their town that makes furniture local. So it's to make sure that there, there is equitable distribution of the opportunities that are going to come out as a result of the commitments that we secure. We're in conversations with SAB, uh, who have developed a market access platform which seeks to match uh, corporates with uh, suppliers and, and the conversations are continuing. We are finalizing the agreement. And as the agreement is signed up, that market access platform will also give us another uh, opportunity where we can match the suppliers on the private South African database with big corporates. So there are efforts being made to ensure that we, we, we start ring fencing procurement opportunities for local producers. But we can really only vouch for you if we have vetted your product, if you have gone through the proudly SA uh, vetting process, we can then confidently say to, sub, uh, to, to customers or end users, whether in the private sector or public sector, that you can buy from this person. We know that their product is indeed locally made so that we don't have these opportunities falling into the hands of, of, of importers uh, who might be posing as, as, as people selling locally made products. So there are conversations happening behind the scenes with Safi around this, there are conversations happening with DTIC around this to try and make sure that we find a model that can accommodate as much as possible, as many companies as possible so that th we don't have others falling outside of this uh, uh, portal simply because they, they, they're not necessarily keen on the Proud DSA membership. We're trying to look at ways in which we can accommodate as many qualifying companies as possible. And that's why the fee structure is, is at the level at, at which it is. We understand that companies have constraints uh, financially and otherwise, especially now cash flow pressures uh, have really mounted during this time. We're trying to find ways to ensure that we can support the industry. Once we start rolling out, we'll communicate uh, whatever the board on our side will have agreed to do to support this industry. Maybe uh, start looking at some discounts that we can be brought in place and, and things like that. So we're still finalizing all of those, but this is what will go out. We will then send this out to edge companies to register as local manufacturers, and then we will then send out communication to the private sector to say there are enough companies that you can then buy from on the portal. I spoke about RSA made. We will continue to list locally made furniture on RSA made, but companies need to join Proudly SA, list their furniture there because there are campaigns being rolled out now. Uh, the, the, the platform has gone through a facelift and to ensure that uh, we reach as many South Africans as possible looking to buy furniture and that they can buy it uh, on this platform because it's locally made. We have, uh, as part of our strategy, a, 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 a plan to continue sourcing a space at trade expos and trade fairs. And, and these are just images of, 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 of how we envisage the, the, the Proudly SA village to, villages to look at, at these platforms, whether it's Decorex or any other platform where we can buy space and members of Proudly South can, can exhibit for free, where we will partner with the DTIC and carry the cost with them and have a village and a pavilion showcasing that which is locally made. And that's the idea. Uh, that we, we want to execute uh, because it's in our strategies, in our plans to continue doing those at the Buy Local Summit and Expo when we come back again in March 2020, if circumstances permit, we will again have a pavilion showcasing furniture that is locally made where we invite buyers from the private sector to come and walk the floors. We will continue to get uh, uh, local procurement commitments uh, for, from the private sector. This is the pledge that we developed together with SAC2 and the DTI, and I think that we must still change the DTI logo to the DTIC logo, where the three of us as a collective, as, a, as of the 13th of March, we started this drive to go around looking for commitments to be signed by 
by us in the private sector, by CEOs, by chairmen of boards, where they undertake that, uh, when that and that they undertake to commit their organizations to buy local. And so we'll continue with this drive to solicit local procurement commitments to support the industry. It is game time, Zansi. The second half is about to begin. We need to change the scoreboard. It's time for all of us to pause and rethink the game plan in order to save the future. I call on all of us to begin changes because greatness isn't reserved only for some people. By buying local, we're choosing to create jobs and sustain the ones we have. Time and time again, South Africans have taken destiny into their own hands, creating products that the rest of the world wanted to buy. You see, the world remembers about us what we sometimes forget. But it's time for change. Let's all buy local. It's game time. Zanzi. Local is like <laughs> Everyday decisions shape our future. Thank you so much, uh, Eustace. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm told that there aren't um, any questions um, that have popped up or comments, um, but we are hoping that even after this uh, forum, um, you know, uh, whoever would like to, uh, you know, continue with the discussion or have a question or make inputs or whatever the case may be, we, uh, you know, we urge you and encourage you to contact us at Proudly South Africa. Oh, contact. The DTI, C, and or PG Bison, uh, any of us will be very happy to step in and, and assist. Uh, this brings us to the end of the program today. We thank you, everybody, uh, the audience, for making it today, for showing up and being part of this uh, uh, important discussion for the sector. Thank you so, so much. Uh, yes? There's a hand up. There's a hand up. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, sleeping on the job. Okay. Uh, yes. May we have the 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 question or comment, please? Um. Hi, happy. Can you hear I, me now? Yes. Yes. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. So it's Gerard Victor here, PG Bison. I thought I would just like to take this opportunity and especially to thank Houston and his team, Happy and to Fatso for all the great work that you guys have done. <laughs> are you well? We are very fortunate that we <laughs> are <laughs> also <laughs> to the court. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to... I'm what going are you guys doing with Musk? Um, uh, please, please, can I, can I just um, ask you to just pause for one second before you continue. Eustace, please mute. Herat, please may you continue? Yeah, so I hope you catch my opening phrase. Yes, okay. I did. Yeah. And I just would like to encourage anybody that's on this call today um, that has joined us to really consider joining the Proudly South African Initiative and the course. There is really a lot of benefits that we are getting from this initiative, which we're not talking about right now. And examples of that is the phenomenal work that the FATO is doing with us in the rural, rural areas of the Eastern Cape. And sometimes these areas really go unnoticed. And that is where the poorest of the poor of our country live and stay. And with the DTIC's commitment, and especially to FATSO, we are reaching out to those communities, communities that need it the most in this country. And I really ask everyone, let's join this initiative. We all take hands together. We will for sure build a stronger South Africa for the next generations. Thank you, AP. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much, Harad. Uh, your, 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 your kind words are very much appreciated. Uh, thank you. And, and, and you are alluding to what, um, you know, the message in our, in our commercial says, that says that greatness is not only reserved for some people. Uh, we can all be great and greatness is really uh, determined by uh, selflessness. So we can all, you know, play our part. 
Thank you. Is there anybody else would like to say something in case I miss um, the hand? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. So, so we are we are now closing the session. Thank you, PG Bison, uh, for being a, a great champion of the work that we do. Uh, honestly, thank you, thank you. We can't do this on our own. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Justin. Uh, your team, Leanne, you are styling. Thank you for your work behind the scenes. Thank you, Herod, and thank you for everybody else who may be on the call with us uh, from PG Bison. Uh, thank you to the DTIC. Thank you, Tafatswa. Uh, we appreciate your input. Thank you, Benedette from Safi. We really appreciate your input as well. Thank you to the media that uh, is in the audience um, and all our guests. Uh, like I said earlier on, thank you to member companies who made it to this uh, session today. I know that Mr. Price Home is in the audience. Thank you. Uh, for being here today. Vita Form is also in the audience. Thank you so much. And all of those other members that I have may have missed, thank you, thank you for being here today. Uh, the Proudly SA team, uh, we thank you as well for, for putting all of this together. Thank you for uh, executives at, um, at Proudly SA for your help. Thank you, everybody. And we hope to reconnect with you soon again, um, uh, you know, to continue this discussion. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you, Eustace. Thank you for leading the team so well. Thank you so much.